All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about today is how to work with probability distributions in PyTorch. Um, so PyTorch has a really convenient distributions package that you can use for working with probability distributions. Uh, and it's especially useful in RL because a lot of times we think of our policy pi as some kind of distribution that's conditioned on the state and outputs uh, distribution over the actions. So for example, pi of a given some state that's not could be a Gaussian distribution. And our goal for the policy could be to output the parameters of that distribution. So let's import the torch.distributions package. And the way it works is you can just create your own distributions by passing in the parameters of the distribution. So here we're going to create a simple univariate Gaussian with mean 0, standard deviation 1. Um, and you can see that we're actually going to uh, turn on the requires grad property here. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit more later. So um, these uh, Gaussians are subclasses of the more general distribution class. So there are lots of dis different distributions that you can work with, and all of them have the same interface, and they support uh, kind of the same things. And the two most useful operations that you can do with any distribution are sample and log prob. So if I use sample, I can pass in uh, any shape I want, and that'll give me a random sample of that shape from the distribution. And we can also call log prob and pass in some sample, and that will return the log probability of that value. So uh, one thing to note here is that this log probability um, actually depends on the parameters of the distribution. So I have my mean and my standard deviation, and I required gradients on both of them. So in theory, I could have a loss that involves log prob, uh, and I can call backward on it, and that will end up back propagating gradients into the mean and standard deviation. So that can be pretty useful if we're uh, trying to learn the parameters of our distribution somehow. So as an example of how that will work, let's say our loss is the negative sum of log probabilities. This might be useful for something like MLE, for example, because if you're trying to maximize the log probability, that's equivalent to minimizing the negative log prob. And so here we have something dependent on log prob, which is in turn dependent on the mean and standard deviation parameters. So if we call loss.backward, uh, that'll populate the gradients, and you'll notice that both the standard deviation and the mean have grad values now. You can also work with batches uh, in PyTorch distributions. Um, and what that means is, uh, so here we're still working with a univariate Gaussian, but when we initialize it, we specify that we want batches of size 10. So it still has a single mean, single, single standard deviation. Um, but um, it now has a batch shape of 10. So when you sample from it, you don't just get a single scalar, but uh, you actually get 10 values per sample. So if I sample like three things from it, I would get a 3 by 10 tensor. And then when you call log prob in the sample, you get log probabilities of each individual element of uh, this sample. You can also work with multivariate normal distributions. Um, so these are uh, different than what we just talked about earlier with uh, univariate Gaussians with batches. Uh, and the reason is because uh, with multivariate normals, you can specify a covariance matrix, and that way you can have uh, dependencies between um, the individual components of your sample. So as an example, let's uh, initialize this uh, multivariate normal distribution with mean 2, and then this is our covariance matrix. And when we sample something from it, we should end up with a shape 1 by 2 tensor. Uh, and you can see, because we have a non-diagonal covariance matrix, if we sample a bunch of things, we'll see that there's some correlation between the two components. OK, so we just talked about uh, a couple things you can do with like batches and um, using covariance matrices as opposed to scalar uh, standard deviation values. Um, so something that's really important to keep in mind is uh, the way that you can characterize a distribution by shapes. So unlike with tensors, where the tensor just has like one shape describing it, distributions have uh, three different shapes that you actually have to think about um, when you define and sample from it. So 
Um, let's work with a slightly more complicated example so then we can talk about what these three different shapes actually are. So I'm still creating a multivariate normal, except now my covariance is not just going to be a 2 by 2 tensor, but it's going to be a 3 by 2 by 2 tensor, uh, which basically means that each time I sample from it, I want three um, separate values, each of which comes from its own covariance matrix. So I have three different covariance matrices. Um, so I'm creating a multivariate normal with that, and then I'm sampling uh, five times from it. Um, so if you want, you might want to pause this video uh, and try to think about what the shape of this sample is going to be. Okay, so uh, now we can look at the three different shapes uh, that matter to us. Um, so we have this Gaussian distribution, and we have two things that are kind of intrinsic to the distribution that we defined. The first is called batch shape, and the batch shape is the number of different values that you're going to sample at once, and these values could be non-IID. So here, the way that we specified the batch shape was we provided it three separate covariance matrices. So every time we sample, we're always going to get uh, three non-IID values, each of which comes from one of these covariance matrices, um, and the same mean in this case. Then we have the event shape. The event shape also comes from uh, when you first defined the distribution, um, except the event shape is the shape of a single sample from one of those distributions in the batch. So here, the way we defined it was we chose to make our covariance matrix two by two, which means each sample that we take from it is going to have uh, two numbers. So in this case, the event shape is two. And finally, we have the sample shape. The sample shape doesn't um, doesn't stay fixed for the distribution. It's something that you specify when you call dot sample. So here we chose uh, to pass in a desired sample shape of five so that um, when we actually sample from this Gaussian distribution, we're going to take five IID samples from the one, the distribution that we defined earlier. So if I run this, you can see that the batch shape is three from the three covariance matrices. The event shape is 2 from the fact that our covariance matrices individually are each 2 by 2. And finally, we have, uh, the, uh, we have 5 samples um, for each element in the batch. And if I print out the entire shape, you'll see that it's uh, 5 by 3 by 2. So in general, if you have a distribution and you call sample with some desired sample shape, uh, the result is going to have shape sample shape comma, bat shape, comma, event shape. So you have this many IID samples, each of which has some bat shape that you defined earlier and some event shape that you defined, both of which come from when you first initialize the distribution. There are lots of uh, other distributions too that you can work with in PyTorch. Um, Gaussians are probably the most common thing you'll work with in this class, but um, another one might be the categorical distribution, if you're working um, in, uh, on a problem with a discrete action space. So the way you define it is you can just um, initialize a categorical distribution with some tensor of values. And so these are the probabilities of my categorical distribution. So I have three possible outcomes, and these are their probabilities. And I can choose to sample um, 20 items from it, and then I'd get something like this. And again, I can uh, call log prob on samples just like I can with any distribution in PyTorch. All right, now let's look at how we can actually use these distributions within neural networks. So typically what you'll see is that you can define networks that output the parameters of some probability distribution, for example, the mean and covariance of a Gaussian. Um, so this is the exact same network we had before. Um, it takes in some input and then outputs a scalar quantity, um, except Instead of using that to represent a sine wave, we can interpret that output as the mean of some Gaussian random variable. And so um, here we generate some random inputs and we pass them into the network. And the network is predicting distributions corresponding to each of these inputs, um, but it's representing them as some kind of mean. And once we have those mean predictions, then we can create a distributions.normal object with that mean, and then we can do things like sample from it.
there's actually another way to do this too, um, and it might be a bit cleaner, um, which is instead of returning the parameters um, in the forward function for your neural network, you can actually directly return a PyTorch distribution. And the reason is because that uh, distributions in PyTorch uh, are still differentiable, so you can bat prop through them, um, which means it's totally safe to return an actual distribution object instead of a tensor. Um, so an example of what that would look like is we have the exact same definition, except instead of returning x here as our main prediction, we're going to create our normal distribution here uh, with the mean x and return that as the output. So functionally, these are the same thing. Anything you can do uh, here by returning a distribution, you can also do just by returning the parameters of that distribution. Um, but this is kind of a nicer way to think about it because um, you have a model that outputs some probability distribution as its prediction. So um, by returning the actual distribution object, you don't have to worry about recreating it yourself later. Um, you can directly use the results of the prediction, um, which outputs something like this, uh, to sample from or take the log probability or so on. So as a more concrete example, let's uh, consider this case where we're trying to train a conditional Gaussian model. Um, so maybe let's imagine that we have some uh, data provided by an expert and we want to run something like behavior cloning where we learn this policy pi of a given s um, by trying to copy that. Um, and the way we're going to represent our policy pi is given some state s, our neural network is going to predict the mean um, of our normal distribution and it's going to have some covariance matrix. And that resulting normal distribution is going to be our distribution over actions for that input state. So we'll start by using the method where we just return the parameters of the Gaussian, and then we can see how we would switch over to returning the distribution itself. Uh, and again, either of those methods is totally fine. You can use whatever works best for you. So here we're defining our Gaussian policy. Um, again, takes in some input, and then we have two components now. The first is uh, we have a set of layers um, that looks kind of the same as before, and that's what we're going to use to predict the mean. For the covariance, uh, we're going to actually assume that it's fixed, so it doesn't depend on the input state. Uh, but we're still going to make it a parameter that we can try to learn from the data. Uh, and as a nice exercise, if you want, you might want to stop and think why uh, we might be trying to learn the log standard deviation instead of just the standard deviation directly. Um, this is usually what you'll see uh, in a lot of RL code. So for our forward pass, um, we can now return two things, the parameter of our Gaussian distribution. So we take in some input, um, we use our predefined layers to predict the mean, and then we return our fixed log standard deviation, and that's going to be uh, a representation of our distribution over actions for this state. So we've defined that. Um, and now let's create our data. So we have some random states, uh, each of which is between negative 0.5 and 0.5. Um, and these are going to be the true means and the true covariance for that state. So this is our expert data. Uh, and we're going to sample from it. So our expert data is kind of noisy. It comes from this uh, uh, normal distribution as opposed to being fixed for every given state. And so the states might look something like this. So since we've defined this policy um, that returns the parameters of the distribution, we can uh, actually train it using backprop to learn the appropriate uh, weights that will give us the right parameters per state. So this is what it looked like. Again, we're taking a lot of the same concepts as before. Uh, we initialize the model, we create an optimizer, and so on. Um, this portion is kind of new, um, and this is something that you might uh, want to look into. Uh, basically. Before, we kind of uh, directly used um, whatever tensors we had for the training inputs and training targets. Um, but here, uh, if you're working with like a really large data set, it's usually not feasible to just like load it all in at once. And you might want to have um, uh, something called a data loader that basically gives you the, the data in batches to train on. And this can be nice because it's pretty natural to do gradient descent on batches. Uh, and this kind of takes care of it for you. So the way you do it is, uh, as an example, you can initialize something called a tensor data set and pass in um, the inputs 
and the targets, and it'll create a data set for you. Uh, but there are lots of other types of data sets too, and you can look into uh, how they work in the documentation. Then from that data set, we create a data loader, um, which will basically um, load batches from this data set for training um, with a batch size of 64, and we're going to shuffle it um, so that we get um, different batches in each uh, epoch. Then we're going to have our standard training loop. So uh, we're going to run this 200 times, or for 200 epochs. And within each epoch, uh, we're just going to do the typical flow of making a prediction, computing the loss, uh, then doing uh, zero grad, loss.backward, and step to do a step of gradient descent. Um, you'll notice here that what we did is, since the policy uh, is supposed to predict some kind of action distribution, um, this policy is outputting these parameters. Uh, and in order to get our loss, we are uh, basically creating a distributions.normal object using those parameters, and then using the log prob function to get the log probability, which we use as our loss. So again, uh, we're doing MLE here, and uh, maximizing the likelihood of the data is equivalent to minimizing the negative log likelihood. So uh, that's why we can do negative uh, log prob dot sum as our loss function. And so we can run this, um, and we'll see that um, the loss manages to go down pretty low. Uh, and we can compare what happens um, with the expert uh, versus our learned policy. Uh, and it ends up matching the expert uh, pretty closely. So now we can go back and see um, how we can replace um, the return values of our model so that instead of returning the parameters, we can just return um, the distribution directly, as I kind of mentioned before. So here, instead of returning a mean and log standard deviation, let's say that uh, instead I want to return uh, the actual normal distribution uh, with mean mean, which was predicted, and then standard de deviation self.log SDD, um, and we exponentiate that. OK, so now instead of returning parameters, we're returning some distribution. Now for the training process, um, instead of expecting parameters for our policy, we actually can get the distribution directly. And then we won't have to worry about manually creating our own distribution each time. We can just directly uh, use log prob on the distribution to get the loss. And so let's run this instead. We get kind of the same behavior. Uh, and here, when it's time to make predictions, again, uh, it's not returning the parameters, it's just returning the distribution itself. So we don't have to worry about creating it. We can just uh, directly uh, look at its mean or directly sample from it. And again, it seems to match the expert data kind of closely, uh, minus some noise, uh, which comes from the actions being sampled from Gaussian anyways. So yeah, um, the, the takeaway here is pretty much that um, you can think of distributions in PyTorch the same as anything else. You can backprop through it. So um, if your goal is to learn some kind, kind of probability distribution, um, PyTorch makes it really easy to specify them and uh, return them from your neural networks. Uh, and using backprop, you can easily learn uh, the parameters of the distribution or the weights that would um, output some predicted parameter given an input. All right, that's it for this tutorial. Um, hopefully you found it helpful. Uh, we'll release this collab so you can feel free to play around with it and try a few new things. Um, and definitely check out the PyTorch website. They have really good documentation. They have some other tutorials um, going more in depth into some of these things that we covered today. But hopefully this gives you a good sense of what's possible in PyTorch. Uh, and you'll probably end up using a lot of these uh, in the homework assignment, so feel free to refer back to this.